Would you kneel with me as we begin the Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can open your word today. We realize that in your word there's power to do what we can't do. And in your promises there's every possible thing that we could need as a human being. I just pray, Father, for the Holy Spirit to guide us today and use the foolishness of preaching to be a blessing to each one of us. In Christ's name, amen. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter had some interesting things to say about Paul's writings. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 15, Peter said an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So even Peter said that there were some things that Paul wrote that weren't very easy to understand. And um, for me personally, I, I love to study the, the writings of Paul because of the fact that we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And uh, that means that there is absolutely total and complete harmony from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And so anytime we read a scripture and, you know, uh, it, it appears in so many places in Paul's writing that he is denigrating the Ten Commandments. Um, for example, in Colossians chapter 2, when the Apostle Paul says, uh, Colossians 2, starting with verse 14, he says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Well, obviously, from Colossians 2.14, something was blotted out at the cross. Some law, uh, because that's what an ordinance is, uh, some law was nailed to the cross. And so, of course, our evangelical the evangelical world says, well, that's the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Well, folk, again, there is harmony from Genesis to Revelation. And if we see something that we think, oh, well, that must mean that, but it's out of harmony with the rest of Scripture, well, the problem isn't with Scripture, it's with us and our interpretation. So, and then, of course, Paul goes on in Colossians 2.16. He says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. The word days is supplied, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Well, again, people jump on this verse and say, see, don't judge me if I want to eat a steak every now and then. You know, because Paul said, don't judge me, don't judge in meat. And then somebody says, yeah, and if I want to have a little wine with that uh, eight-inch steak, then leave me alone, because Paul said, don't judge people on meat or drink. See, and so people throw out health laws. And then the clincher, of course, 
is at the end of verse 16 when it says, don't judge people about the Sabbath. And then everybody says, well, see, it doesn't matter if you go to church on Saturday or Sunday. So if I want to go to church on Sunday, leave me alone. If you do, if you bug me about it, then you're judging me and you're, you know, going against what Paul said in Colossians 2. But folks, if we interpret that verse that way, then we've, we've thrown out large portions of Scripture. We've thrown out the health laws of Le Leviticus chapter 11. We've thrown out the admonition in Genesis 9 not to, you know, eat flesh with blood in it. We've thrown out the admonitions of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that our body is the temple of God and we're supposed to keep it in good shape, you see? And so... Obviously, that's not what Paul was talking about there in Colossians 2, verse 16. And when it comes to the Sabbath, well, if this is talking about the seventh day of the week, well, then Paul is flying right in the face of Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. And he's flying right in the face of the creation story when God rested on the seventh day. So what in the world, then, is Paul actually talking about? Well, the only thing in the entire Old Testament that had meat and drink and a holy day and a new moon and a Sabbath, the only thing that had all five of those elements were the Jewish feast days. There were meat offerings, there were drink offerings, there were holy days, there were new moons, and there were ceremonial Sabbath days. So you go, bingo. Paul wasn't talking about health laws or the seventh day Sabbath at all. He was talking about the Jewish feast days. And he was saying that by the death of Christ, Christ did away with all of those sacrifices because they were all pointing forward to him. And at the cross, Christ did away with all of the Jewish feasts because all those feasts were pointing forward to what Christ would do. So you go, oh, wow, that's neat. That makes scripture in total harmony with itself. And that's our job as Christians, not to, to stand up and say, I've got the truth, and, and deny Scripture, our job is to harmonize all of the Word of God. That's our job as a Christian because the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself, does he? He doesn't do that. So if there's a contradiction, it's not the Bible's fault. It's our fault. It's our fault. And so we need to dig deeper to understand what the verses are actually saying. Well, this morning I'd like to look in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. This is the very heart of many of Paul's statements where he talks about the Ten Commandments. Of course, Romans 6.14 is the famous verse where Paul said, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, Ms. Wright, I saw you quoting that as I was coming out with it. We hear that all the time, don't we? I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. And what that means is, is the Ten Commandments were done away with at the cross. And so now I just believe in Jesus and I'm going straight to the kingdom. But is that what Paul was talking about? Was Paul in these passages and especially in Romans 7 that we're going to look at this morning, was Paul in any way downing the Ten Commandments? Or is it actually our understanding of what Paul was saying that the problem really is? Well, we're going to take a look at that this morning. Romans chapter 7. Of course, Paul's letter to the Romans is exactly that. It's a letter. It wasn't written in chapters. 
he's writing a letter to people. And so Romans 7 is simply a continuation of Romans chapter 6. And in Romans chapter 6, we find these three major points in Romans chapter 6. Number one, that baptism represents the death of the old man of sin and the rising of a new life in Jesus Christ. When the old man dies, the new man, Christ Jesus, takes over and victory is the result. Number three, when Christ is at the helm, the law no longer condemns because we are under his grace. Now, let's ask ourselves a question this morning. If I am living on a daily basis, developing and living out habits where I am breaking my conscience and I am doing things that I know is wrong, and that little voice says to me, that's not right, that's wrong what you're doing. You need to look to Christ to overcome. Now, folk, if, if I'm in a life of sin, does the law condemn me at that point? It does, doesn't it, Gail? See, the law of God, in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, in their perfect state, were in total harmony with the law of God. But when they sinned and they separated themselves from the Lord, now the law of God condemned them. Before they sinned, being in total harmony with the law, they naturally lived it out. It was life to them. But when they sinned, the law of God no longer was life to them. Now the law of God was death. And so, folk, in our fallen condition, in our fallen condition, the law of God cannot save us. The law of God simply and solely condemns us. That's what it does. Romans 7, Paul illustrates what he said there in Romans chapter 6. He said, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Now, who's Paul talking about here when he says, he's talking to the brethren, he says, I'm speaking to those that know the law. Well, who is he referring to there? Who knows the law? The Jews did. The Jews did. The Jewish Christians and so Paul is addressing them, and he says, I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. If we are walking independent of Christ and choosing a path of sin, does the law have dominion over us? It does, doesn't it? It truly does. The law haunts us. The law follows us. And of course, the Holy Spirit and the law of God work together. But our footsteps are haunted. And there's a, a conviction in our mind. And that's the Holy Spirit saying, you're outside of Christ. You're walking in sin. And you're condemned by God's law. And that's what the law does. It condemns. Doesn't save. Doesn't save. But as long as we are living out our natural carnal heart and our natural nature, the law has dominion over us. And we're dead in trespasses and sin. That's just what we are. So Paul says... 
The law has dominion over a man as long as he's alive. As long as he's alive, the law condemns us. Now Paul uses an illustration. He says, the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband is dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. If while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Now, if a woman married to one man all of a sudden decides that he's not enough and has another partner, well, what would we call being around and being with two men? What would we call that woman? We'd say she's an adulteress, right? And so what is Paul's point here? Paul's point is, is that we can't be married to two men. We can't be married to the old man of sin and Christ at the same time. We, that's, that's being an adulteress. That's being an adulteress. But Paul says, if the husband is dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. And notice there, did Paul say the law died? No. He said that the old man dies. The old man dies, not the law. You are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another. Well, who's that other man that Paul encourages the people to be married to instead of to the old man. The new man is Christ Jesus. Yeah. And Paul says, you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Well, let's analyze this. As long as the old man of sin is in the ascendancy, and we are responding to him, the law condemns us. We are under the law's condemnation and we don't have peace. The law does not give us life, it gives us death. Now Galatians 3.21, Paul says, is the law then against the promises of God? Are they at cross purposes? God forbid, that's impossible. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So Paul says that the law cannot give life. It can only give death. But Christ Jesus came so that he could give us life. So that he could give us forgiveness from the times we've broken that law and in marriage to him and in submitting ourselves to him he can enable us to keep that law now let's define our terms here in Romans 7 the woman represents the Christian the husband represents the old man of sin. Okay, so the woman bound by the law to her husband as long as he's alive. So the husband in the passage represents the old man of sin. When the husband or the old man of sin is alive, the woman is bound to him. She's bound to her husband as long as he's alive. And so we too, we are bound to our <coughs> carnal nature as long as we are giving in to it. We're bound to it. We're controlled by it. If the husband or the old man dies, then the woman can be married to another man. 
and that other man is Christ. The woman cannot be married to both at the same time. That's adultery. So now think for a moment. We have all over the world today, we have this idea that, well, you can keep on sinning, you can keep on giving in to the old man, and you can still be a Christian. Well, according to Paul's analogy in Romans 7, that's adultery. That's being married to two men at the same time, and you can't do that. You can't do that. We have become identified with the old man of sin. He is our life. The law says we must obey him. We follow his dictates and can do nothing but follow them. We are slaves to do wrong. But when we realize the grass is greener on the other side, that we can be married to someone else, even the new man, Christ Jesus, and be set free from the old man of sin. We long for it. However, the law, because it can't lie, tells us that we can't be married to both parties. We can't have two husbands. One of them has to die. Otherwise, it would be adultery. So either... Either the old man of sin must die so we can be married to Christ, or we continue on on a habitual pattern of sinful living, and who dies in that process? The Lord does. The Lord dies. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus goes back to, obviously, he doesn't go back to Calvary. But our sinful behavior and our giving in to our old man crucifies Christ. It crucifies the Son of God. And so Paul said in Galatians 2, he said, I am crucified with Christ. What was Paul talking about that was crucified here? What was crucified? the old man of sin. The old man of sin was crucified. Nevertheless, I live, Paul says. I still am here, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's no longer me struggling and trying to keep God's commandments, which I can't do, but I look to a new man because in my carnal nature, we can't, we can't keep God's commandments. We can't do anything right because the Bible says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Well, can they do that? Of course not. Paul then says, can you do good that are accustomed to do evil? Again, the answer is, of course not. So now, instead of imbibing what our old man says, now we look to the new man, and the new man frees us from the condemnation of the law and frees us from the old man of sin. Uh, we've all heard the old proverb. I think Ben Franklin, I think he invented it. I don't know. Maybe it was before him. The old proverb says, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, folks, is we can't help ourselves. So that, that idea is ridiculous. God does not help. It's not a joint, you know, it's not God's working and, and I'm right there and we're in part. No, I'm giving up. 
I'm admitting that I can't do it. And I'm now looking to Christ by faith to do what I can't do. God helps those who help themselves. That's a bunch of baloney. This couldn't be further from the truth. God helps those who realize they can't help themselves. Now that's the truth, folks. That's the truth. And the greatest news is, is that when we come to the place where we realize we can't help ourselves, this, this great controversy will be over. Because God will have a people that are so dependent upon his power, they're going to turn the world upside down. They will be unstoppable. The hundred, this, this is the experience of the 144,000. And folks, this message will completely turn this world upside down. Because every, think about it, Every institution, every church today is built on the premise that if we look to men, men can lead us to heaven. That the Pope is, is God's representative, and if we just follow what he says, folk, we can't follow any man. Inside us, our old man inside, or any man on the outside. That's spiritual suicide. That's suicide. Amen. We must look outside of ourselves to the new man, Christ Jesus. And folks, the people that do will turn this world upside down. And this, this whole great controversy will be over. It'll be over. Married to the old man of sin, dwelling with him, we can do nothing but obey him as long as he lives. We can't do anything else. But we can let him die. That we can do. And that's where that awesome gift called choice comes into play. We can choose every morning to let the old man die. That we can choose to do. And when we do, that we can then be married to the new man that day and watch him work to do for us what we can't do. He can help us to resist the power of sin. The new man can do that, not the old man, not the old man. The context of this letter declares that Paul is illustrating what he said in chapter 6. Now the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Group teaches that Paul's point here is that a person can't remarry unless the first partner is dead. And folks, that's ridiculous. Paul is not talking in Romans 7 about the relation about a man and woman and the reasons why you can marry and remarry. That's the furthest thing from Paul's mind. He's only thinking about the death of the old man of sin and new life through Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's talking about. The reformed folk come along and say, the only grounds for divorce and remarriage, uh, no, the only grounds to remarry is if your first partner, your second partner, if they're dead. And I said, well, on what basis do you say that? Well, Romans 7. That's not what Romans 7 is about at all. Paul is illustrating the deep spiritual truths of death to sin and new life in Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Notice Paul talked about this throughout his writings. Throughout his writings. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. 
and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, folks, as long as the old man lives, the law of God condemns. It can't do anything else. It can't do anything else. The law of God, if it sees sin, it condemns it. it. It can't do anything else but that. But when a person says, the old man is going to die, and I'm going to surrender my habits, my thoughts, to the obedience and the captivity of Christ, then I can be married to the new man. And the new man does for me what I can't do for myself. Romans 7, 5, Paul says, For when we were in the flesh, when we're in the old man, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. What does the Bible say in Romans 6? For the wages of sin is what? Is death. The old man can only produce death. That's all we can produce. So if we remain in the old man and letting the old man do what he wants to do in our lives, the end result, folk, is death. Now we, we can, you know, we can play theological games and say, oh, I can be saved in my sins. I'm just going to believe in Jesus. Well, you're going to lie yourself right into the grave, friend. And I would be too. It's just a lie. Because the only thing our nature can produce is death. That's the only thing that any human being can produce is death. The Pope, Ted Wilson, whoever a person is, the only thing that the old man produces is death. But now we are delivered from the law. Did the law disappear? Didn't go away, did it? It's still there. But we're delivered from the condemnation because now we're looking to Jesus. We're delivered from the law, being dead wherein we were ill. The law kills us. It slays us because of our natures and what we do with our natures. That we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. While we follow the impulses of the carnal nature, the law condemns us as a transgressor. The result is eternal death, separation from God forever. Through the life of Christ now dwelling in us by faith, we are set free from the power of sin and the law's condemnation. And so when we accept Christ and allow him to be our Lord, we're no longer under the law now, are we? Now we're under what? We're under grace. Did the law disappear when we got under grace? No, it didn't. It's still there. But now we're in Christ Jesus. Now we're looking to him by faith, and we're not condemned anymore. Because what did Paul say? There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are what? In Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If we're still in the flesh, you bet the law condemns us. 
because that's the law's function. That's the whole function of the law of God, is to condemn. Why? Why does the law seek to condemn and to awaken in us our depraved condition? Why does it do that? Well, what did Paul say in Galatians 3? He says, wherefore the law was our what? Our schoolmaster to bring us unto who? To bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And then Paul said, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So does that mean now, is Paul saying in Galatians 3 that the Ten Commandments have poofed and they're gone and they're no more? No. He's simply saying that when we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ, the law doesn't condemn us anymore. Why? because the life of Christ that is now dwelling in us by faith, that life and the law of God are the same thing because Christ lived the law of God in humanity, didn't he? He lived it. So if we've accepted Christ and we're in submission to him, we're no longer under condemnation. We're no longer under the schoolmaster. With the power of Christ in the life by faith, that life can produce victory, vitality, and glory. Why can't it produce those things? Because we're not doing it anymore. Now we're letting Christ do it in us. That life saves us from the drudgery of trying to live the Christian life apart from Christ, which is impossible. It's impossible. Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What did Jesus mean when he said, let him deny himself. What did Jesus mean by that? Somebody has to be starved to death, don't they? Who has to be starved? The old man. And so Christ and Paul said the exact same thing. Same thing. The only way we live is if we die. The only way. Jesus said, whoever will save his life will lose it. The old man lives on and we are involved in sin and continue to make poor choices and live a life of sinful behaviors. Christ said, you let that old man live what will, you, what will happen? You lose it. Folk, in, at the second coming of Jesus, there will be nothing arbitrary. There will be nothing vindictive for why some people will go to heaven and some people will be lost. Those that will be lost at the second coming will be lost because their old man is still alive. And that old man of sin and death cannot go to a place where there is no death. It can. So there's nothing vindictive on the part of Jesus. It's simply, will we let the old man die and let Christ live? Paul said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? There's our question. Is there something wrong with the law of God? Is there something faulty with the Ten Commandments? So all of these verses, you're not under the law, you're under grace. You're delivered from the law. In none of this is Paul saying there's something wrong with the law of God. 
Because he asked the question. Is there something wrong with the Ten Commandments? And Paul says, God forbid. That phrase, Paul used it several times in his writing. It's the most emphatic way that Paul could say, that's impossible. That's insanity. That's ridiculous. The Greek phrase is, he says, meganota. Meganota. That's impossible. May it never be, ever even considered. So Paul says, is there something wrong with the law of God? Because all it does is condemn. And Paul says, that's impossible. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with you and with me. That's where the problem is. And we need to acknowledge it if Christ is going to live in our lives. We have to acknowledge that we have need. Paul says, I didn't know about sin but by the law. Well, if we don't know about sin, folks, then why would we ever think we need a Savior? We wouldn't, would we? When do we go to the doctor? When we realize we're sick. What does the law of God do? It tells us we're sick. Not to leave us there, not to destroy, but the law of God says you're sick so that you'll look to the great healer and physician. Paul says, I didn't know about sin, but by the law I did not know about lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. Now, now think about this for a minute. How many times do you listen to on the television, a, a TV preacher, and he's talking about, you know, accept Jesus, accept Jesus. Well, why do I want to accept Jesus if those very same preachers never mention the law of God? If there is no law, there is no sin. And if there is no law and no sin, then why do I need a savior? I don't. I don't. So the gospel of today, friends, that destroys the law and lifts up Jesus is a false gospel. It's, it's false. false. The law of God and Jesus go hand in hand. The law points us to Christ the law of God reveals sin. It functions to condemn the guilty sinner. The law of God has no power to give life. It points out defects. It reveals the places where sinful man falls short. It can't produce life. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. And the law of God doesn't just condemn outward acts. It sees us on the inside and strikes at the very core of our being. It demands righteousness within as well as without. Paul, what did Paul say? He'll, we'll read it in a minute here. But notice these other verses about the law. Romans 4.15, the law works wrath. Where no law is, there is no transgression. No law, no transgression, no need for a savior. They all go together. Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Those are all in Paul's writings in Romans. 
This should be Romans 3.31. Paul says, do we then make void the law through faith? Again, meganota. God forbid we establish the law. Galatians 3, 21 to 25. Very misunderstood passage. Is the law against the promises of God? God forbid if there had been a law given which could have given life, righteousness should have been by the law. So there is no law that gives life. If there was, then Christ didn't have to come because righteousness could have simply come from the law. But the fact is, is, is that there is no law that can give us righteousness. There is none. The scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Before faith came, we were kept under the law. Before we turn to the new man, when we are in our carnal flesh, we're under the law. The law condemns us. Condemns us, friends. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law points out sin so it can point us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Not by our works, but by Christ and through faith in his righteousness. And after faith has come, when we accept Christ, the law doesn't condemn us anymore. Now we have peace with God, as Paul said in Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The law of God condemns that Christ might heal. The law of God brings death that we might find life in Jesus Christ. The law of God that's, a, that's the wrong word. The law of God oh yeah, the law of God shreds that Christ might make us whole. That is the correct word. The law of God and Christ Jesus work hand in hand to save lost humanity from sin and self. Romans 7, 9 and 10, Paul said, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be to death. You see, folks, Paul, Paul loved to apply the Ten Commandments to all his outward acts. And as long as Paul applied it only to his outward acts, Paul was alive and well. As he says in Philippians 3, he says, If any other man thinks that he hath whereof he might boast in himself, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. See, a Pharisee only applies the law to his outward behavior. And as long as he just applies it to the outward behavior, then he can keep Christ at arm's length, feel that he's righteous, and think that he's okay with God. But Paul says, when the commandment came, when Paul applied it to his inward thoughts, 
when Paul applied the principles of the law of God to what he was thinking in his mind, he says, sin revived and I died. You see, folks, the law of God applies to what we're thinking too. And if we're thinking wrong things, but simply don't have the avenue to carry them out, that's still sin. That's still sin. So the law of God doesn't just apply to what I do on the outside. No, it goes to the inside. Inside. And so Paul said, when the commandment came and I applied it to what I think in my head, the anger or the lust or the cruelty or the lies, Paul said, sin revived and I died. Again, the law of God doesn't die. The old man of sin has to die. Has to die. The law of God was not meant to be the hammer of condemnation. It was ordained to life. As long as man walked in harmony with its precepts, the law was glorious. The law is accepted through faith in Christ is glorious. It's freedom. It's joy. It's happiness. When men and women step outside of the law today, it is sheer misery. You know, folk, I mean, in our world today, we, we have people that say, oh, um, you know, I, I found another love. What? To, to become unfaithful to your partner, and we call that love? That's not love. That's called lust. That's evil. That's wickedness. But see, we justify things in our heads so easily and so quickly. We justify wrongdoing in the name of love. True freedom, true freedom, true joy, true happiness is found in submission to Christ that enables us to keep the law of God. That's true freedom, friend. That's true freedom. Anything outside of submission to Christ that leads to obedience to God's law, anything outside of that is slavery. It is slavery of the worst kind. Because you are enslaved to a nature that tells you what you're going to do whenever he wants to tell you. That's slavery, friends. David said, I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. When David wasn't walking in submission to the Lord, he was a slave of the worst kind. Worst kind. Applying the law only to our outward acts and then comparing ourselves with others, that's pharisaical righteousness. We become puffed up, confident in our Adventism. This doesn't cut it at all. But that's what pharisaical righteousness does. It only applies the law to outward behavior. And then we compare ourselves and say, you know, I'm a pretty good guy because, well, it's like the guy in Luke 18. He said, Lord, I thank thee that I am not like other people. I, I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of all that I have. And that was a Pharisee. Applied the law to his outward behavior. And the manifestation of that was, this guy over here, he's not hitting the mark. And I'm better than he is. So when we compare ourselves with other people and think we're better, we're a fair. That's pharisaical. It's pharisaical. 
And Jesus said, except your righteousness will exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, it's not going to go to heaven. None of us will go to heaven with Pharisaical righteousness. Finally, Paul said, sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. Anybody, friends, that speaks ill of the Ten Commandments? At the very least, they're totally deceived. They're lying to themselves. And they're lying to people that are listening to them. The Apostle Paul never denigrated the Ten Commandments. He said it's holy, it's just, and it's good. Paul was tricked by the law. This was not the law's fault. Paul thought it only applied to outward acts. It had nothing to do with the anger, lust, jealousy and other fruits of his carnal heart. Paul felt he could harbor these thoughts and get away with it. When Paul realized and admitted that the law applied to his inward thoughts that harboring sin was actually carrying it out, he was shredded by the law. Paul realized the law was spiritual and applies within, just as Christ said. That if you have anger in your heart against your brother, you have, committed, you have committed murder. And if you are lusting at a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. There's nothing faulty with the law of God. It does what it does. It reveals sin. It can do nothing more, nothing less. The only faulty element is found in the sinful heart of man. And there is but one remedy. I'm thankful this morning, friends. I'm thankful for the beauty of Scripture that shows a law that can never be changed, that is still an absolute. And I am grateful today for a Savior who can deliver me from that condemnation of that law.